to announce the the recording will be available um, not only on the River Edge website and or the coalition itself has um, a Facebook page and you will be able to get a hold of it that way. But you need to give us a week or so. Um, we don't get the videos immediately from Zoom. So um, it takes a while for them to uh, unload them and um, disperse them or whatever it is they do. So um, so give it a week or two if you you know want to share this program with somebody else. Um, it won't be available like tonight yet <laughs> or next week. Well, early next week, probably. But anyhow, so that takes care of the, the nitty gritty of this evening's program. But I want to get started with a little bit of background uh, about the coalition. Uh, in January of 2022, we launched a new coalition. Whoops. Are you guys seeing a screen with something other than Zoom on it? Okay. Hopefully we're back to that. All of a sudden there was something else on my screen that shouldn't be, shouldn't be there. So anyhow, the um, in January of 2022, we launched this new coalition and that's dedicated to sharing both the enlightenment and enjoyment of bird life in our area and beyond. The Ozaki Birding Coalition brings together the Noel J. Cutright Bird Club and four organizations, including River Edge Nature Center in Newburgh, the Friends of the Seabird Bog in Stockville, the Lac La Ronde Conservancy in West Bend, uh, and Mequon Nature Preserve. Um, the first meeting was supposed to be in January, but unfortunately it was postponed because of the weather. So the actual first meeting took place uh, in, in February and that one was hosted by Mequon Nature Preserve and that one was on wood ducks. Uh, this evening's um, program is sponsored by River Edge and it, it's the uh, birding by ear program that we hope you've all um, basically um, tuned in to hear and see tonight. So. Uh, and the next ones will be in April. Uh, and those two programs, um, I'm not sure if anybody from those organizations are on. Carl, do you see Courtney and or Nick and Corey from Mequon and or Lac La Ronde? No, I don't see either one of them. John O'Donnell is here. John John is one of the folks who organized uh, the, uh, uh, the coalition and uh, um, he was very instrumental in uh, in, in uh, leading the way to uh, to getting us all together. I don't know if John wants to unmute and uh, and say anything uh, at all. He should feel free. Okay. I guess not. Okay. <laughs> in the meantime, I will announce that the next meetings, as I said, um, will be um, sponsored by both Lacaron and and Macwan. The one that is. Um, uh, coming up on April 6th is the one that um, Lac La Ronde is sponsoring. That's the one that was postponed. And that's Project Snowstorm with Jean Jacobs. Uh, and that will be both live and on Zoom. But you do need to register through Lac La Ronde. So um, check on their website tomorrow, this evening, yet, whatever. Uh, and then register uh, either um, for the in-person and or Zoom program. Uh, and um, those of you that were already... Um, had already registered for those programs, you are, you don't have to go back and do it again. You are already registered. But if you're new and have not done that already, you will have to register for, for that program on Project Snowstorm on April 6th. Um, the other one that's coming up at Mequon Nature Preserve, that one is on April 19th. Uh, and that one is limited in the number of people they can handle because it is in person and it will be a woodcock walk. Uh, with Dan Panetti from Wild Birds Unlimited. So um, if you want to go birding with Dan Panetti, uh, looking for woodcocks on the 19th of April, um, again, go to the Mequon Nature Preserve website and there will be instructions about how to sign up for that. But again, do it soon because um, those programs, will, well, that one especially will fill up fast because there aren't that many spaces available. So, so those are the upcoming programs. Um, and John, uh, John and or Carl, have you thought of anything else you want to announce yet this evening? Um, no, I, well, I should remind uh, particularly members of the, uh, of the Cutright Bird Club who are part of this uh, uh, group tonight. Um, we will be having our annual Birdathon Bandathon on May 14th. So you might want to uh, put a star on your calendar for that date. Um, both in terms of thinking about turning up to help count some birds. Um, Al Sherko and his crew will be banding that day as well. 
Um, and we'll also be using that as our principal fundraiser. Um, that uh, that Birdathon not only uh, supports uh, River Edge, um, but it provides funding uh, for our various speakers during the year. So um, it's uh, the, the Cut Right Birds Club pledge to the coalition uh, was that we would help underwrite the cost uh, of, of speakers for these various programs. So much appreciated, Carl. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mary? Yes, go ahead, how John. Is it done? I just figured out how to unmute myself. <laughs> I, I've been trying to find that button for the last five minutes. But anyway, I just also wanted to uh, announce that the um, Friends of the Cedarburg Fog are going to have a canoe outing. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have my calendar right in front of me, but it's the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. And uh, it'll be a canoe outing on Mud Lake. Um, and uh, the focus will be on the birds of uh, Mud Lake and also the birds in that part of the uh, Cedarburg Bog. Should be a lot of fun, but again, limited number of people. Because... Yeah, limited, right. Very limited uh, because of the canoeing. Uh, if people have a kayak or their own canoe, um, that they can bring it, but they have to get uh, clearance uh, from the Friends of the Bog because, uh, again, we, we can only have so many boats out at a time without uh, creating mayhem. <laughs> so, John, but, uh, are you, are you going to put out an announcement uh, that we can share? Yeah, this will, this should, uh, I'm waiting for um, the final approval from the um, Education Committee, but informally, uh, I've talked to all the members and this, this will go. So I'm, I'm just alerting people if this is something you want to do, uh, save the date and uh, uh, through uh, Nick or Carl or myself, we will send out an announcement to the various organizations. All right. Any other partners on board now? If not, we're gonna get started. So if, if they do jump on, we'll ask them to sort of save their questions and their announcements till the end. And by the way, again, anybody that's on right now that is a participant, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will take care of those questions um, either when there's a break or at the very end. So, um, so you don't lose those ideas, go ahead and type them into the chat and, and we'll, uh, we'll answer them at the end. So, all right. So I think without any further ado, we're gonna get started here. So um, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker on birding by air. Her name is Liz Herzman, and she is the um, senior naturalist um, or senior natural resources educator for the Wisconsin DNR uh, at Hork on Marsh Education and Visitor Center. She is a member of um, the Wisconsin Association for Environmental Education and also served uh, as the Dodge County coordinator for the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, she has recently received uh, the 2021 um, Bra Educator of the Year Award from the Bluebird Restoration Association of Wisconsin. Um, she was recognized for informing and educating the public about cavity nesters, including bluebirds, through workshops and tours that she conducts at the, at the center. Uh, Liz is involved with the annual Hork on Marsh Birding Festival, guides birding hikes and paddles, and works with uh, school students and adults who visit the um, Horicon Marsh regularly. So without further ado, I'm gonna let Liz tell you the rest of the story. And uh, if she hasn't already done so, I'm gonna ask Liz to unmute herself uh, so that she can get started, so. All right, thanks you. thank you so much. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Um, Mary, if you can just let me know or give me a thumbs up if you can hear me all right. I sure can. Okay, excellent. And I do have my screen shared, so hopefully everybody can see that as well. Um, before we get started, I do want to um, emphasize again at the chat function. If you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to put those in and we'll try and go back and answer those. Um, but we may also be using the chat function a little bit during some of our interactive quiz. So um, if you're not familiar where it is, it should be at the bottom of your screen or sometimes at the top, it's got a little rectangular button with a triangle below it that says chat. You can click on that and put your answers in for the group to see. But I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, I've had some interactions with some of the partners 
within the coalition and um, really excited to be able to share some of my knowledge and my passion of birding with all of you. And I think it is perfect timing because as many of you have probably recognized in the last maybe week or so, spring is coming and uh, technically our meteorological spring is here and the birds seem to know it already. Um, you know, at Horicon, we have had a number of migrants uh, pouring in over the last couple of days between Sandhill Cranes, our Canada geese. Um, we've had a killdeer report, our red winged blackbirds. I had some white fronted geese this morning. So it's really nice to see and hear some different things and uh, shows us that spring is most certainly in the air. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Liz Herzman. I'm the wildlife educator for Horicon Marsh. I've been there for about 12 and a half years now. And full disclosure, I was not a birder when I first started working at Horicon, but there is absolutely no way that you can work at Horicon Marsh without um, becoming a birder. And so I was lucky enough to have some really amazing birders that literally took me under their wing and showed me the ropes. And it's really inspired a passion in me. Obviously, I'm still there and I'm still birding. And it's something that I love to do and be able to share that with other people as well. And so that is the goal for tonight is to try and inspire some birding, but maybe in a little bit different way. I think many of us are used to birding with our eyes, but many of us also bird with our ears. And so now that we are starting to thaw a little bit and winter is near its completion, I think we all recognize again that the sounds have most certainly changed as the seasons change. Um, and I do apologize if you hear any banging in the background. I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old that I think are a herd of elephants upstairs. So I do apologize <laughs> if there's any um, loud noises coming from the upper realms of my house. But we are gonna talk a little bit about ear birding. So what is the importance? Why do we do it? And we use our eyes, right? As humans, that is one of our major senses that we help us do a lot of different things. It helps us function in society. And it most certainly is a sense that we use while we are birding. But there are many times that dictate for us to use something besides our eyes. And so when we're using our ears, it helps us locate a bird. So many times, you know, we are out birding in low light conditions, there's leaves on the trees. It can be rather difficult to actually see the bird. But if that bird is singing or if it's calling, it makes it a lot easier for us to pinpoint where that bird is and then hopefully be able to get our binoculars or our eyes on that bird. Uh, many of you also know there's a lot of secretive birds that don't necessarily want to be found, especially if you're out on a place like Horicon Marsh, we have all those rails and bitterns that just hunker down in those cattails. It makes it really difficult to find. But the moment they make a little bit of noise, well, that makes things a little bit more easy, uh, easier to find them. And then of course, the calls, the songs can be a very, very distinctive field mark for many of our bird species. And I'm gonna show you a little example for that and we'll, we'll see from there. So we've got two birds right here. I'm gonna play a call for each. So um, tonight's presentation, your sound is gonna be pretty important because we're gonna be playing a lot of different bird calls. So you may have to adjust your sound on your computer to make sure that you can hear everything okay. So I'm gonna play two different calls and I, or songs and I want you to type in the chat or just think in your head, whichever is more preferable, what bird you are listening to. Okay, so that is call number one. You can type in the chat if you would like to what you think it is or just think in your head and I'll monitor that off to the side. And if you don't know, that's totally fine as well. That's part of what tonight is all about. All right, here is number two.
Okay, so once again, if you feel inclined, you can put what bird you think that is in the chat and I will disseminate the answer in just a moment. I think we have one guest. <laughs> yep, and the one guest that's in there is correct for both. <laughs> but we need to be more specific. I'll so with that one, yeah. <laughs> so though the guess that we have in the chat is Meadowlark, and that is spot on for both. But we need to figure out which one it is. Is it the eastern meadowlark or our western? And these birds look very, very similar, right? There are they are very, excuse me, they look very close, but the songs are what tell them apart. And so we have our western meadowlark on the left, our eastern meadowlark on the right. And if you're looking really closely for field marks, what you're looking for for the western meadowlark is this yellow, what they call mahler stripe, goes up a little bit higher on the face than it does on the eastern. And that's kind of one of the field marks. But if you're looking at this bird from a distance and there can be some variation, it's a very tricky bird to tell apart unless they're singing. If they're singing, there's a clear difference between the two. And this is certainly the case for a number of different birds. So learning those songs, those sounds, those calls really can help when you're identifying a bird, especially if you never get eyes on it um, or get, get good eyes on it. So uh, a pretty clear example of birds that we may see um, in the state of Wisconsin. So I know the presentation is called Tune In. But I'm also going to teach you a little bit about how to tune out. And this is something that was very helpful for me when I was learning to bird by ear, um, especially at Horicon, because there are a lot of sounds out there at once. You know, when you get out there at, at a dawn chorus, it can be very overwhelming with all of the different sounds that are coming at you. And so what I've tried to learn how to do and to train my brain to do is to weed out and tune out all those sounds that I know exactly what they are. So for example, at Horicom, I tune out all of the geese because there's so many of them calling, right? I tune out the red-winged blackbirds. As much as I love those songs and those calls, especially right now, as you get later in the season, those are some things that you start to turn out, tune out so you can start piecemealing the other birds that are um, talking at that point. So we're gonna do um, just a short snippet, maybe like 30, 40 seconds of this video. You don't have to watch necessarily because it's not going to give you any answers. What I want you to do is to listen and try to think about how many different bird species, different sounds you are hearing in this video. Okay. And that's what we're going to try and focus on. And if you'd like to, again, put them in the chat, feel free. Otherwise, just kind of keep a mental note in your head as far as how many different species you are hearing. So here we go. All right, I'm gonna pause it right there. So if you'd like, pop in the chat, how many different species of birds did you hear while you were listening to that? Your best guess, there's no right or wrong answer on this. All right, someone had five. 20, ooh, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm not sure I got them all, but just having been there, <laughs> I can pretty much bet on it. Absolutely. 
So even just with a 45 sec second clip of two different splice videos at the marsh, yeah, you can get anywhere from five to 15 to 20 species that are easily found from everything from your ubiquitous Canada goose, red winged blackbirds. There was song sparrows in the background, swamp sparrows, um, common yellow throats were being heard. So there was a lot of different species. Cat, just, I heard a catbird there someplace, I thought. Yes, so. right at the beginning, there was that catbird that was whistling away. Um, absolutely. So there was a lot of really great sounds just from a small clip. And again, that can be overwhelming when you're starting to learn how to bird by ear. So when you start tuning out all the geese in the background and all the red winged blackbirds, the ones that you know most frequently, then you can train your brain a little bit better on how to pick out those new and different sounds, focus on those as far as which ones you want to start learning. So some of that takes a little bit of practice, but it's really fun once you get a chance to do that. So you're gonna hear me talk a little bit tonight about songs and calls. And there is a difference and I'm gonna to try to do my best to make sure I'm using the words appropriately. Um, calls are something we refer to when we're talking about a bird's communication all year round. It's usually short bursts of communication. It's not the full on song that you hear during the breeding season. And so there is a difference. Um, birding by ear and learning those different sounds is literally like it's learning a new language for each species, right? Because they don't just have one song. They don't just have one call. There are tons of different variations. If you go to different parts of the country, there's different dialects along with it. And so you really have to be tuned in to those different calls and the different songs. So songs are what we are gonna start hearing right now. Some of them we already are, right? Springtime, we've got our birds that are really getting into the mating season. A lot of times it's the males that are making these calls. They're using them, or excuse me, songs. They're using them to attract a mate to defend their territory. And many times they're a very repeated and particular pattern. And a lot of people think they sound a little bit prettier than just the little chirps and trills that you might hear otherwise from those calls. So it's not just learning one song per bird. There is so much variation and that in itself takes a lot of time. Um, you know, my husband and I are sitting out on our deck in the middle of fall at night at like 10 o'clock because we're listening for the flight calls of any thrushes that are going over. I mean, who does that, right? <laughs> but those are things that you can start to figure out and to learn as you get better and better with learning this new language of sound for our birds. And what we typically recommend is, I'm not sure where those pictures aren't there, um, is master the sounds that you hear most frequently. So master the sounds and the calls and the songs that are in your backyards um, or your local parks or around your apartment complex, wherever it is that you are, learn the ones that you hear the most, because those are the ones that you can train your brain to learn the most easily. So I think everybody is familiar with the morning song of our morning dove or that now really amazing breeding song that we hear from our cardinals starting in February, um, or even the potato chip call that we hear from our goldfinches. So learn those birds that are in your backyards and it's gonna make things a lot easier. You don't wanna just start with some of the hardest warbler species out there or anything. That's gonna make you frustrated and it's not gonna go well. So start simple, start with what you hear the most frequently, learn those, master those, and then you can most certainly branch out from there. Oh, there's my other ones. So our chickadees and our orioles, things that are frequently in our backyards. From there, the other recommendation that I have is to literally watch the birds sing. So if you stare at those birds, whether it's your backyard ones or ones that are up in a tree um, in the middle of Horicon Marsh, really take the time to watch their mouths, their beaks, and watch them sing. There's something in our brains that triggers when we hear a bird sing and watch it at the same time, we are gonna remember it so much better. You will be amazed. So if you're really, really focused in trying to learn all these different songs and these calls, watch those birds sing, watch their beaks, and you will be amazed how much faster you will learn these sounds just by watching them do that. Our brain is an amazing thing. And then something else that you can do, and this is a more personal aspect to birding by ear, 
is associate calls with some sort of a memory. And again, this is why I say it's personal because it can be a very personal memory when you're doing this. So we're gonna delve into the depths of my brain right now, which is a little scary sometimes, but I'm gonna show you two examples of some of the calls and songs that I associate with a memory from something in my life. So on the left here, we have our black-throated green warbler. I'm gonna play the song for you quickly. So the mnemonics for this is the trees, trees, murmuring trees, or um, it's that did it, did it, did it, okay? So I was a huge fan of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles when I was growing up. And the theme song has a little chord in there where it says turtles in a half shell. And it sounds a lot like that second call of our black-throated green warbler. Green, we have our green in the black-throated green warbler name, which reminded me of turtles. And that is my crazy way that I remember the black-throated green warbler. I will pick that out anywhere. I can hear those a mile away because of that single memory that I associate it with. I don't know why, but that's what happens. Um, another example for me is our Sora. This is a species we don't get to see too often at Horicon Marsh or other wetlands where they're very secretive, but we do a lot of night hikes and this is one of those species that we can certainly hear at night. You may be familiar with the call, with the sound, with the song. <laughs> Oh, I played the wrong one, <laughs> or I played the wrong one. Right. There's our Sora. And to me, oh yeah. Anybody know what movie that's from? It's the Wicked Witch from The Wizard of Oz, right? And so those two calls, those songs, remind me exactly of that. And so that's how I associate our Sora, which is a very unique call and song to begin with. But I always think of the Wicked Witch of um, The Wizard of Oz is how I remember those. So somehow in your brains, in your memories, figure out a way that you can connect something with you personally to those sounds that you are hearing in nature. And it does make a big difference. And it can help you remember some of those wild and crazy ones. And when you try to explain it, people, uh, it doesn't always make sense, but if it works for you, that's all that matters. Okay, so I'm not gonna read this whole slide. This is a lot, but when we are out and listening for birds, there's a lot of things to try and key in on. One is the pit. So how high or low are those songs? We want to think about the quality of the songs, of the sounds. Is it a warbler, uh, or excuse me, a warble, a buzz? Is it just a rattling? So what is the quality of those sounds? And then, of course, how long the sound is, whether it's a call or it's a song. Is it really short bursts, like a Henslow sparrow that literally just goes, pick up, and that's it? Or is it this really long and drown out, drawn out song like a warbling vireo or maybe a house finch that just seems to go on forever and ever? And then how fast is it, that tempo? How many beats does the song have? Does it go quick? Is it really slow? That can tell you the difference between a red-throated vireo and a yellow-throated vireo. How fast is that tempo? Um, is it loud? Is it soft? What is the volume? And then what's the repetition? Something like a common yellow throat is gonna go witchety, 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 three times every time. And so what is the repetition of the song, of the note, of the call in the sound you are hearing? So those are all things you wanna start thinking about as you are training your brain to listen. And you wanna make sure that you start simple with this. Um, how I started learning was first mastering those things I heard in the backyard. And for me, my backyard was also Horicon Marsh, so that helped. But then from there, once I mastered those species, I started choosing five species every year that I knew I was going to have a pretty good chance of seeing and hearing um, either during migration or during the rest of the year. And I really keyed in and focused on those species as best as I can and learned those sounds. 
And that made a huge difference. I wasn't trying to learn every warbler, or every vireo all at once, because if you do that, you're going to overwhelm yourself and it's not gonna be a very fun experience. But if you start out slow and just pick out different ones every year, it will make a big difference. And then of course, it's just repetition, learning and studying this. Um, in our house, we have one of those uh, CDs with Wisconsin bird songs on it. We started playing that in like February. When we were doing that, my then two-year-old, now seven-year-old son, he was pretty darn good at his bird songs because we listened to them day after day after day. And it's really important to do that and to retrain ourselves because Wisconsin winters are quiet, right? We have a few birds, but it is not like our spring and our mass migration season in, um, in May. And so we have to basically relearn all those birds over again before um, our spring migration starts. So listening to those recordings make a big difference. And then play some games. There's some great games on the All About Birds website through Cornell, where we're gonna kind of do something similar in a little bit. And it basically gives you the, the sound from the bird and you have to try and figure out what it is. And so just having some fun with it as well can certainly uh, make it more enjoyable when you're getting into that spring season once again. And I'm gonna play just a little bit of this clip. This is from Cornell University. It's called Birdsong Hero. And this is just a different way to learn those sounds. Um, we know everybody learns in a little bit different way. And so this is um, basically combining our visual learning with our audio and looking at spectrographs to see how those birds are calling and how they look on paper. And some people really key in on that. My husband is an engineer. And so he's keyed in on the different patterns that our birds uh, make when they're uh, doing a song or a call. And being able to see that for him in like a spectrograph is super helpful. So I'm just gonna give you a quick example of this. We'll watch for just a minute or two. You can see some of the examples of spectrographs. Here's your chance to become a bird song hero by playing the bird song ID game that starts from square one and trains you how to visualize and remember the songs that catch your attention and always stick. Time to show what you're made of and become a better birder at the same time. First, let's get you trained. Birders get up before dawn, not just because they're that kind of obsessed, but also because that's when most birds are singing their hearts out. This northern cardinal song is a common early morning sound across much of the U.S., so you might already recognize it. What's amazing is that the bird is performing impressive feats of vocal gymnastics with those repetitive whoops spanning more pitches than a piano in just a tenth of a second. Visualizing a cardinal song helps you fully appreciate the vocal genius. Here on this spectrogram, you see time from left to right and pitch from high to low. And the brighter it is, the louder. Spectrograms stimulate the visual parts of our brain and help us commit song patterns to memory. That's why many birders use them. Now that you've got the basics, you're ready to train your visual brain with Birdsong Hero. To get started, we'll play this tufted titmouse song three times. While you listen, compare the three spectrograms and decide which one is the correct match. Then we'll reveal the answer. Here goes. And here comes the answer. The correct answer is B. Titmice repeat the same notes in a series. Compare that with A. Notice how the American Red Start changes things up at the end? And C. The morning dove starts with a little flourish.
Okay, so I just wanted to show that as an example because we all learn in different ways. And that's a really nice way to be able to visualize the song. And just like our brains being able to learn when we watch a bird sing or call, our brains can also learn very well by visualizing that sound that's coming out of the bird. So uh, this is called Bird Song Hero. Again, it's on the Cornell site. Um, if you want to enjoy it a little bit more or use that as practice, it's a really fun opportunity to do so. And I think everybody knows their own learning styles and how they learn best. And that might be something that would work really well for you. And I hope that that gives you a little bit of insight into the way that- Now let's try the care- As well. So how are some ways that we can improve? Um, when we're trying to bird by ear. One of the things we can most certainly do is take notes, right? That's what we do while we're birding anyways. We know the habitat, we use eBird, we do all sorts of different things. So sometimes just writing down what we're hearing can help us learn that sound as well. Um, using phonetics and mnemonics. So thinking about um, our chickadee, right? We know the chickadee dee 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 call, but there's also the cheeseburger call, right? The which is the breeding sound that we're hearing right now. And we call that when we talk to our third graders and teach them, we call it our cheeseburger call. because It's going cheeseburger, cheeseburger. Or for our adults, we, because we know it's a mating call, we say it goes, hey, sweetie, hey, sweetie, right? So learning those mnemonics and putting human words towards the sounds we are hearing from birds can also help us remember them a little bit better. Here's another. So that is our tohi. And the drink your tea is what the, a lot of the, the songs and uh, the CDs and everything tells you to put towards that sound. So drink your tea. So that is a little red-breasted nuthatch. And sometimes it really helps to make some sort of a written description about what you're hearing. One of my favorite descriptions for this particular song um, is that it sounds like um, a mini backhoe or forklift backing up, right? So it's got that ink, 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 ink. So that beeping sound. So that's a, a written description that you could use for it. Another one here, our black and white warbler, the written description is it sounds like a squeaky wheel, right? Squeaky, 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 going around and around. And then my favorite written description, I shouldn't even say written. This is our bobbling, which we lovingly call our R2 bird. Sounds like R2-D2 from Star Wars and has that very mechanical um, computerized sound almost. And it's very jarbled and all over the place. So having some sort of a written description that you can think about when you are hearing these sounds also can be very useful when you are learning. Okay, so we are gonna do a little bit of a quiz today. I wanna start getting us thinking about these sounds that we are starting to hear and will continue to hear now for the next couple of weeks. So here is where um, if you are comfortable using the chat, you can feel free to put your answers in. Um, it would be wonderful. Otherwise, you can most certainly just keep those answers in your head as well. This is meant to give you a little bit of insight into the sounds that will be coming and hopefully get you excited for the spring migration that is starting and is semi underway and can help us go from there. So I'm gonna play uh, some sound bit from one of these birds that we have listed here. And if you wanna put the number, or excuse me, the letter A, B, C, or D in the chat, you can most certainly do that. And then I will, of course, give you the answer at the end. So here is the first sound. <laughs> Oh, 
And again, you can feel free if you'd like to pop the answer you think that it's in the chat, A, B, C, or D. And I'll give you a half a second to do that and I can take a look at our answers. We started off easy. I'm gonna start with some backyard birds to see how we're doing. I'm seeing C's from just about everybody, which is our Northern Cardinal. And that is absolutely correct. We heard it on that um, spectrogram as well. One of the best sounds to hear in February, right? We know that <laughs> that is the start of breeding season and um, we know that spring is on the way. So I always love hearing that song in middle of February, just about every year. Okay, here's our next one. Good job to start. All right. Go ahead and put your answer in if you think you know. Okay, it looks like we are between house finch and goldfinch. So we are on the right track. It is in the finch family, which covers just about all of them. <laughs> but this is our house finch. And this one can be tricky. A lot of times, it's just a very long and jarbled, warbling call that seems to go on and on and on forever. But um, once you learn that song, it is one that, again, is very nice, especially if you have house finches in your yard and in southern Wisconsin, they are a pretty common backyard feeder bird uh, to start learning their songs as well. All right, here's our next one. All right, I'm seeing a lot of Ds, a lot of American Robins coming in. I have actually not seen and or heard a Robin since last fall, so I am eagerly anticipating my first Robin. But they are most certainly a species that um, I know for me has special meaning. My birthday is March 15th, and my grandma always told me that on March 15th, on my birthday, the robins would be there. And most of the time, that's pretty correct, even though sometimes they're there a little bit earlier. So I always love hearing robins as they um, make their way a little bit closer to us during the spring migration season. All right, here is our next one. All right, how many people started cringing when they heard that call? <laughs> so this is a house sparrow, also known as the European um, sparrow. They are a non-native species, but they are very common in our backyards. And um, some people don't mind having them around. Others, if you are a landlord for any sort of nest box, like a bluebird box or a tree swallow, swallow box, they are most certainly not your favorite species to have around as they can be fairly aggressive to many of our native species, especially our cavity nesting birds. Um, but they are common backyard birds and they have a very monotonous single call. It's not, uh, not all that exciting, but it is there and you know exactly when those house sparrows are around. Okay, we're gonna get into a little bit of some of our marshy species here. All right, I'm seeing C's coming in nearly across the board. And 
that is our house wren. You are absolutely correct. Um, these are found fairly typically on brushy, shrubby edges, especially if you have a nesting box or some sort of natural cavity for them to be. They make a lot of noise for a small bird. And they can be pretty feisty. Which is why I absolutely love these. So house wrens, um, if you are lucky enough to have in your yard, a uh, very distinctive call, even between the other wrens that you might have, such as marsh wrens in a little bit different habitat. So those, those uh, sounds are pretty distinctive. Okay, here is our next one. This one, for whatever reason, was a challenge for me for some time. This is actually a goldfinch. And for whatever reason, this one was a challenge. I would walk out on a spring morning and I hear this calling and singing and I just couldn't click what bird it was. And then finally I saw it and I was like, oh my goodness, it was a goldfinch. I should have easily known that. One of those that maybe you just don't think about as often, knowing that goldfinch um, are around quite frequently. So listen to those goldfinch a little bit more. They also make a little baby or a potato chip call when they're in flight. And those are uh, fun to be able to listen to as well. Okay, here's our next one. All right, I'm seeing A's coming in across the board for our white-breasted nuthatch. Again, another fairly common backyard bird. These are also one of my favorites. <laughs> I agree, Joy, I see that. They do sound like they're laughing. I guess I never thought about that, but that is a great way to put it. I'm going to remember that from now on. That's very helpful. So yes, our white-breasted nuthatch a little bit different than that red-breasted nuthatch we heard earlier with that ink, 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 ink. Um, so again, those sounds do make a difference. Okay, here is our next. Okay, I am seeing a lot of D's, which is our blue jay coming across the board. And you are absolutely correct. The reason there are two different sound clips for blue jays is because blue jays make so many different sounds. Um, they obviously make that very standard J. There's our J, J, but they also have a lot of sounds that sound like a crazy car alarm that's going off. And they are also great mimickers. I remember I was at a workshop in the Madison area and we were in this grove of pine trees and I heard what I swore was a red-tailed hawk um, sitting above me in the pines. And I was looking for it and looking for it. And I just couldn't find it. And it was calling away and singing away. And eventually I found that it was just Blue Jay that was making just the most amazing red-tailed hawk impression. I mean, it completely had me fooled. So you do have to be careful with some of these, like some of our other mimickers. They can be very, um, very challenging when they are mimicking other species. Okay, here's our next one.
All right, I'm seeing a lot of our Ds coming across the board. This is probably one of, I don't know why, but it's one of my favorites, our great crested flycatcher. It just has this loud, clear, crisp sound when you hear it. And they're literally singing from the treetops and you can hear it so amazingly well. I'm sure you can probably hear it on your computer when they get into that creep, creep, creep. It just resonates with you. And I think one of the fun parts about this bird as well is if you're really, if you're really good at whistling and can do a very sharp and loud whistle, you can get these to call back to you, which is very entertaining during the spring season. Uh, not for long periods of time, obviously, but they will respond to a quick whistle if, um, if needed. All right. Here's another one. Okay, I am seeing a lot of A's coming in across the board for our kill deer. And sometimes the birds make it easy and whoever named the bird made it easy, they decided that their sound sounded like they were saying, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer, kill deer. And it makes it a little bit easier to remember the species based on what you're hearing. And I'm sure this is a pretty familiar sound. They also have some pretty dynamic trills and other sounds that come out, especially if they're going into their broken wing display. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting sounds that they could make to help them sound distressed so that any sort of predator that might be near their nest will hopefully follow them in the opposite direction. And if anybody's ever seen and or heard that spectacle, it is quite the sight and sound. All right, here's our next one. All right, I am getting a lot of bees coming across the board. You can understand why if you're sitting out in the middle of the woods alone at night and you hear something like that, all sorts of stories can come up, you know, Sasquatch, maybe that's how some of those got uh, created, but birds can make some pretty amazing sounds and our screeched owl is certainly one of those as well. That whinny call um, can be a little bit eerily haunting if you're hearing that in the middle of the woods in the middle of the night. And a small little bird can make quite a bit of noise, just like uh, some of our others, like our little house friend. Pretty amazing. Okay, here is our next. This sound is in homage to our, our Horicon Marsh Bird Club president. This is his favorite bird. So if you are familiar with our Horicon Marsh Bird Club president, Jeff Balls, you may have a sneak peek for the answer. But this is our wood duck. And this also goes back to one of my favorite sayings that we use for a lot of our fourth graders is that not many ducks actually go quack, quack. Um, we have over 20 species of waterfowl that we see coming through just for con marsh and only a female mallard actually goes quack quack, which is what we teach all of our kids that ducks say and sound like right, but um, as a waterfowl hunter. Um, you have to really learn the different sounds that ducks make because it can make or break um, what you might be harvesting during that time. <laughs> That is our wood duck as it is in flight. <laughs> the 
This one's a bit tricky. All right, I'm seeing some D's and some B's coming in. All right, so this is again, goes with our saying that not all ducks go quack quack, right? This is our redhead, very famous at Horicon Marsh for having um, largest breeding population east of the Mississippi. And they literally sound like a cat. And I had never heard this sound before until I was up at the visitor center on the refuge off of Highway Z. And there was a small little pond behind the refuge. And I heard what sounded like cats. And then I scoped them out and realized that it was a pair of redheads that were out there. And that was uh, essentially their, their mating song. So pretty amazing sounds that different species make. Uh, some that you certainly uh, wouldn't really recognize unless you were uh, familiar with the fact that they made those sounds. Okay, here's our next one. Any thoughts? Hmm. All right. This one might be a little more challenging. All right. I've got a C coming in. So this one is our common yellow throat. They make a very, um, you can tell what it is because they have a certain repetition. It's always three of the witchety, witchety, witchety. <laughs> So witchety, witchety, witchety. Um, common species that we see on the edge of marshes and the cattails quite frequently. You don't always see them very often. They can be very, very tough to spot. But when they do that witchety, 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 it's a, it's a light bulb that goes off that you know that that common yellow throat is somewhere in that brushy cattail area along the edge of uh, marshes or riparian areas. All right, I'm seeing B's and C's coming in um, and you are on the right track most certainly with that. This is actually our rose-breasted grosbeak. A lot of people say it sounds very similar to a robin song, but prettier, more melodic. Um, our scarlet tanager is also very similar, except a lot of people describe it as a robin with a sore throat. It seems to be a little bit scratchier as they are making those sounds, but our rose-breasted grosbeak is a little bit more fluid and a little bit more melodic in that song. Okay, here is our next one. These are some short verse. It's for whatever reason, the best I could find for this one. But I think you can probably still All right, very good. I'm seeing lots of A's coming in across the board. So this is our Baltimore Oriole. They have a very, very clear and crisp notes as they are coming across. You can hear them. So that is our Baltimore Oriole. About May 1st is when we should start hearing some of those songs as they move in. Yeah. So it's not too long before our jam and orange feeders will be coming out. Okay, here is our next one.
Okay, I'm seeing a lot of C's coming in with our ruby-throated hummingbird. And that would seem to be the logical answer, right? Because it is the most common hummingbird that we have here in Wisconsin. However, you never want to rule out the fact that there's a variant or a vagrant that is coming through. Um, this is a Rufus hummingbird. We actually had that this at our house two summers in a row um, a number of years ago. It's possible some of you on this program may have wandered into Mayville and sat in our driveway to find this beautiful male Rufus hummingbird. But hummingbirds do make different sounds. And so this one, um, my husband actually kind of heard it and saw the flash of orange first. And when we started listening a little bit more, he was like, gosh, it sounds like a, a hockey or a football referee that's just blowing this really high pitched whistle compared to our typical ruby throated hummingbird. You could really tell there was a difference. This Rufus hummingbird is even a little bit smaller than our, um, than our ruby throated hummingbird and their sounds reflect that. <laughs> So never doubt your ears. There might be something different in there if you hear that it just doesn't sound quite right. All right, a couple more. Here's our next one. sure many of you can imagine sitting at Horicon Marsh in the middle of the night or right at dusk and hearing that sound. That is our Virginia rail, a very common marsh species, but very tough to actually get uh, a good look at. But these are most certainly birds that you can hear, especially at dusk and at night. And that kidik, 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 is the sound that we hear from our Virginia rail. They also make this really interesting grunting sound, which is uh, pretty interesting to hear. But uh, for our Virginia rail, if you can imagine taking two quarters and hitting those together, um, that is a way that you can remember our Virginia rail. Uh, King rail is very similar, but a little bit faster paced and would be a way cooler sighting, right, Carl, um, than, <laughs> than our Virginia rail. But they have been sighted at the marsh and hopefully again. Okay, here's our next one. seen a lot of C's coming in with our tree swallow, our tree swallow. We have a number of different swallow species, uh, six I believe, that you could get. And if you have a really good day, you could get all of them on the same day. And many a times our swallows are flocking in mixed groups and it can be rather difficult if you've ever seen them flocking and catching insects over a small stream or a river or the marsh they're flying at a really top-notch speed. And so trying to be able to get a good focus on any of these birds can be a challenge um, unless they eventually go and land on a dead snag somewhere nearby. But if you can list for, listen for them, you certainly can start picking out the species, especially when you start getting into like bank swallows and northern rough wing swallows. Learning those calls and those sounds that they make, the songs uh, can help you pick those out amongst a mixed flock of swallows, which can happen quite frequently. So uh, pay attention to those a little bit as well. All right, we're gonna put a couple tricky ones in here just to make sure we're paying attention and getting ourselves prepared, right? We'll add some fly catchers.
All right, this is probably one of my favorite fly catchers, probably because it's the one I tend to hear the most around the marsh. This is our willow fly catcher. They make a sound that goes fits view, fits view, and are typically around edges of marshes. Fits view. But our fly catchers have a lot of really interesting mnemonics that go along with them. There's such things as quick three beers and um, a variety of others that seem to have to do with um, pizza and or beer. So kind of fun uh, food and drink related mnemonics for our fly catcher family. All right, our next one, we will do a couple of our warbler species. <laughs> All right, so we are hopefully thinking May, right? When we're listening to that, that is our yellow warbler, our sweet, sweet, very, very sweet, or sweet, sweet, you're so sweet. And for us at Horicon Marsh, yellow warbler is one of the most common that we see, and they also nest at the marsh. So it's a a uh, sound that we hear quite frequently around our area. And of course, we've got to throw a vireo or two in there just for the measure. All right, I'm seeing some C's coming in across the board, which is our red-eyed vireo, and that is absolutely correct. Now, I love the pneumatics for this one. Um, you know, it's got a pretty distinct pattern that it goes along with, but uh, if you listen to some of the CDs and uh, the sounds that go along with it, they'll say, uh, the red-eyed vireo is going, here I am in the tree, look up, you see me, here I am in the tree. And so they have that pattern that you can think about and put the words towards it. How I also love to think about it is sometimes the red-eyed vireo and the yellow-eyed vireo can be a little bit tough, but the yellow-eyed vireo is like a mopey version of the red-eyed vireo. It's a much slower one. So if you think about the words that you put towards it, it's here I am, in the tree, look up if you want. So you can kind of put those words towards it and think about the two different ones that are there. So the red-eyed vireo is a little bit faster paced and the yellow-throated vireo is a little bit slower, but with that same cadence all along. So sometimes it's just putting fun twists on the different sounds you're hearing to help you remember what's up there. All right, so good job on our quiz. I'm hoping that that gets you really excited for all the sounds we're gonna be hearing shortly um, as migration continues to pick up. There is still time to practice. And again, you don't have to learn all of these at once. And there are so many resources out there to help you learn. We saw a couple of them today from Cornell University. There's Stokes Field Guide to Bird Songs. There is iBird, there's Audubon Birds, there's some cool um, technology called identifiers where you get these little cards and you can press the button and you can learn your sounds that way. So there's all sorts of different resources out there to help you learn the bird by ear. And I can guarantee it's a really useful skill to have as a birder. Um, you know, some of the best birders don't even have to take a pair of binoculars with them. All they have to have is their ears and they are in great shape. They'll be able to identify nearly everything that's out there. And it really, really is a game changer, especially as you get into those low light conditions, those early mornings, the nighttime species that we have on the marsh, um, really, really helpful to have your ears and going um, to go that way. One of the other things we highly recommend, go out with experts, right? This is an amazing coalition full of people that have 
years and years and years and years of experience birding by eyes and with their ears. So if this is something you're really interested in learning about and adding as a tool in your toolbox, go out with our other birders. We all love helping other people out and being able to do this. And so we can certainly learn from one another. One of the places you can do that is the Horicon Marsh Bird Festival. Um, we will be having it this year. It'll be May 6th through the 8th. It is always Mother's Day weekend at Horicon Marsh. And this is our 25th anniversary. We are the oldest bird festival in the state of Wisconsin. We're um, pretty excited about that. Um, secret note for those of you who are on this call, events should be going live tomorrow or Friday, most likely tomorrow. So if you are looking to sign up for some of those trips, um, start looking at um, horiconmarshbirdfestival.com and there's a whole variety of different trips. Um, you know, we're doing things a bit differently due to COVID precautions, but we are super excited to be able to have a more normal-ish <laughs> bird festival this year compared to previous years where we haven't had a chance to do that. And of course, I work at the Horicon Marsh Education and Visitor Center. It's located off of Highway 28, has the big giant woolly mammoth out front. I hope you get a chance to come and visit the center and our Explorium, which is all of our hands-on exhibits. Make sure to say hi to Curly or Mammoth when you stop in. And of course, go through the Explorium if you wanna learn a little bit more about the history of Horicon Marsh. Um, so I'm gonna leave you with this because I know a lot of us have uh, younger people in our lives that maybe can benefit from our passion and from our experience. And this is a wonderful quote that I love from Rachel Carson, um, basically uh, empowering us to go out and bring in a new generation, whether it's to birding or natural resources or whatever that might be. Um, if a child is to keep alive their unborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him or her the joy, excitement, and mystery of the world we live in. And so my challenge for you is as you're going out and birding or enjoying the natural resources, bring somebody with you, bring someone from our younger generation, whether that's um, a new young birder, whether it's a grandkid, a niece, a nephew, a son, a daughter, whoever. Um, we have a, a responsibility, I believe, to bring the next crop of birders and natural resources experts along. And I hope that um, you will take that challenge along with me so that we can continue keeping coalitions like this alive for years to come. So I appreciate you listening to me tonight and to the birds that we were listening to as well. And hope that you have a wonderful spring migration season, whether you are watching or listening for birds. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that people might have um, as time allows. So thanks again for having me tonight. Well, thank you, Liz. That was a lot of fun. I think all of us enjoyed the quiz, and I don't think I'll ever forget the Sora Rail. Um, the the <laughs> sound was just right on, and uh, it, it's certainly uh, memorable. So one really great way to remember the Sora. So um, we do have a minute or two if people have a, a you know a brief question they'd like to ask. Um, go ahead, Mary. Can I ask you to unmute everybody so that we could all give there's a round of applause um, and yep. just pre pretend we're all in one room together. So. <laughs> one here. I'm hearing people, but I'm not sure. I'm hearing some, so thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Seeing lots of great comments in the chat. I, I appreciate that. It is um, I, a great way to learn about birds. So use those ears, right? I, I would, I, I'd like to say a particular thank you to Liz. I look forward to this program in, in part because uh, as members of the Cutright Bird Club would recall, uh, one of the great ear birders uh, in, my, uh, in my acquaintance was Noel Cutright. And uh, um, you know, no, uh, one, one of the great reasons that the uh, River Edge Birdathon was always a success was that uh, uh, Noel would spend the first hour right before and after dawn sitting on the back porch um, and then walk up to the parking lot and say, well, we got the first 60. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and then left, left the rest of us to try and fill in, fill in from there. So, um, 
but that was uh, <laughs> fascinating. I love the sonogram uh, material. That that made it uh, to to me. That was something that I I never really thought about. And uh, see, seeing those patterns as you heard the song, I really appreciate why people have always uh, appreciated uh, appreciated the sonogram uh, usage. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for tonight. Hi, you're welcome. A lot of fun. Anybody with a brief question? It might be James' question, but I'm not curious. Yeah, I had a, a comment to share. <clears throat> um, we uh, just completed a um, uh, a series of uh, bioacoustic recordings in the Cedarburg Bog. And uh, I, we're going to have a, a program on this uh, that we're going to share with the Mequon Nature Center in the fall with uh, Dr. Barry Casper. But uh, I'm absolutely convinced that this is going to be the way of the future as far as uh, doing bird censusing. Uh, it involves putting out very sensitive uh, recording devices that are um, that are, are fixed to record at uh, dawn and dusk, or you can really set it for any times and you can set the, the band lengths, but basically um, uh, it, it's gonna revolutionize uh, bird sensing, at least in places like the Cedarburg Bog that are so difficult to access. So uh, we had these out for approximately a little over two months, two devices in different places and in a very remote area of the bog that hardly ever has been frequented. Uh, and, uh, it, took, it took about uh, six weeks to uh, get all the, uh, uh, the sonograms uh, analyzed. And um, we were surprised to find that there were some species out there <laughs> we didn't know that we had. And I, I just think it's, uh, it, that's that's a program that uh, is going to come, and I, I do think that uh, the Badger Birders doing doing a, a feature on this, isn't, aren't they, Carol? Uh, if Gary will never get around to writing it, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll, I'm I'm going to be talking to him in the next. <laughs> please, uh, yeah. please put a little bird in his ear. Yeah, but the the analysis is done by looking at at the sonograms, uh, and then uh, additionally having uh, expert birders or people who specialize in birdsong uh, additionally uh, analyze the, uh, the recordings. And it, it, it just has been uh, really uh, fascinating. And uh, I think we're going to see more of this uh, in the future, not, not just in the Cedarburg bog, but in lots of places, particularly difficult to access places. Sounds exciting. And I can't wait for the program in September. Is that when it is, Mary, September? I don't know. I haven't heard, but that kind of sounds like it'll, it'll be a program. Yeah, we have, we have talked about it uh, with uh, Nick Lynch, but uh, sure. that's that, that's going to be a really interesting program. And more to look forward to. Well, Liz has little ones to put to bed, so <laughs> we'll um, probably end the program here. But um, do we snuck out. He's supposed to be in bed right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you're going to be uh, there to be able to, to say goodnight to him. But um, we want to remember, remind people that the, the next two uh, meetings will be, um, the first one will be at Loch Leron, uh, and um, go to their website to sign up for the Project Snowstorm. That one will be on April 6th, Wednesday, April 6th. And the uh, second one, uh, Mequon Nature Preserve is hosting the Woodcock Walk with Dan Panetti. Uh, and that one is the 19th of April. Uh, and again, go to their website to sign up for that one, but um, you, you're, it's a very limited thing. So you better um, do it soon. Otherwise you won't get in for that one. But, um, and we do, we have, Liz and I are both um, involved with Bluebird Restoration Association of Wisconsin, and I'm running a workshop for them next Saturday. So if anybody wants to come learn more about bluebirds and how to attract them, along with a lot of the other cavity nesters, that program will be at River Edge uh, at one o'clock on the 12th of March. So, so join us for those various programs. Good to see all of you this evening. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Liz. Uh, it was a fun, fun program. We're all gonna remember this for a long time. We're all looking forward to seeing and hearing all those migrants and now we're ready for them. Well, all, you know, you, you managed to um, kind of 
loosen some of those cobwebs so all of us now will be out there listening for, for those species as they return. So have a great evening, everyone. Thanks again, Liz. And uh, Thanks, Liz. Thank you, Mary. Thank, thank you, everyone. Mary, for hosting. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Good to Bye. see you all. Bye, Bye. 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 Bye.